cold, nightmares come true. Ain't this what they've been waiting for? You ready? What's up, world? This is Backtrack, and you're here with another episode. We are in Atlanta at the legendary Tree Sound Studios. And I don't use that word loosely. Legendary studio is right here, where everybody comes from around the world, and people in Atlanta says it's too far to go to. But the vibe is right here. And this is me, Don Cannon. I'm here with the icon, the icon, the world renowned KY Engineering. And we're here to do dreams and nightmares from scratch in the mix. Like Kenny said, this is Legendary Tree Sound Studio. I mean, 2012 is when I mixed the Meek Mill track, and I just wanted to kind of bring it back here because I also mixed seven other albums in 2012, <laughs> right here in the same studio, in the same room. And of course, shit, Nappy Roots also, they did their thing here as well. They from Kentucky, so you know, I definitely had to give them a shout out. Lil Wayne, Lollipop, they even did What a Time to Be Alive, Drake and Future in here. Let me show you around. breaks I had, you know, I'd come over here, play some pinball, get it in, you know, I was average. I also come over here and get the pool in. It would always be a lot of different people here. Or sometimes if it wasn't nobody here, I'd just go ahead and just play by myself. Let's yeah, I'll lo lose all my money at this table. I don't know what I'm doing, but if you see me on the basketball court. You at least gotta get you one shot in real quick. I, man, I wouldn't even know what to do, bro. Just, just one, just one. Ah, cheese. I'd probably do something like that. Get you, get you at least <laughs> one in. Let me see. See if, see if I can get a good break. No, it's decent. Decent break. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not good. And then this is my favorite part over here, because it would always be something smelling real good in this kitchen. Tell them who used to cook. Molly used to go crazy on the meals in here. It'd be 2.30 in the morning. You'd be in the studio, hungry, almost ready to go home. Then she'd come through with that big ass plate. <laughs> Loved it. Give you energy, and now you're up till 9 a.m. mixing. Man, some legendary listening sessions happened on this stage. Two Chainz did his thing in here when he debuted his album, based on a true story, 2012. Once again, another album that I mixed in the same room. Crazy. Now we enter the infamous. Looks a little bit different in here now, though. Yeah, nice and cozy in this joint. Yeah, it used to be a lot of, uh, like, a drum set here. This is still actually the booth to the room. We got the good old piano. I know that thing ain't tuned up. <laughs> You're now in the famous room 11. This is the spot where I mixed four songs off of his first album, Dreams and Nightmares. I always loved this room because it was off in the cut in the studio and it just had a vibe in there, man. I come back, sit on the couch, take me a nap if I wanted to. So a lot of those albums that I mixed, I did a lot of stuff in the box, which means it's me kind of mixing in Pro Tools. I ain't really used too much of the board, maybe a vocal or something. I might run it through a compressor or something and run it back in, but I pretty much kept everything in the box just to kind of make it easier for me. So if I did have to move around to some studios, then I would be able to jerry up and pick it up and do what I needed to do. So one of the main things that I loved about this room, of course, is the speakers. So they got the original NS10s. It's not the remakes, the CLA version, none of that. And of course, I had these amazing speakers. And I love how they sound. So when I'm trying to get that loud sound, this board's been here the whole time. It was here before me. It's probably been in this room since 1968, for real. Of course, you got your good old patch bay. So I got my studio essentials. This is kind of what I need to get everything done. Need that iPad for sure. Because when I'm doing mixes, I always like to put everything in notes and those notes update to everybody that's involved in the project. So definitely keep the iPad on me. Of course, you gotta have a laptop. Then, got everything I need in here. This is my safe. We full of the hard drives. Literally have everything from KY2 to three, four, five, two chains, Adobe Atmos. We've got backups in there. I don't even know which one Meek Mill is off. I think this is the original hard drive that I actually mixed it on. Good old Glyph, shots out to that. And you know it's old because now everything is USB-C. This is Firewire 800. Records that was mixed, that's 10 million sold. Records, this, I mean, everything, man, it's crazy. Like, I can't even really describe it, but no, it's, there's no value on this box at all. And, and for me, like I said, I like to always kind of, I cherish the stuff like this and I make sure that I keep up with it and I have backups. I got on-site backups, I got off-site backups. So I make sure that I never lose any of this stuff. I mean, I have so much unreleased music that, you know, 
I would have to put a hit out on somebody if I, if I, if I ever lost it. <laughs> this is it. The original what I learned how to record on. And it still works to this day. Watch it's loading up a session now. So yeah, you see, still actually works. And it was crazy because of course that's the beat right there. So those first two tracks. And I only have 16 tracks in here total. To work, do the whole song, I have 16 tracks. So that's the beat. These are vocals. And a lot of times, say if an artist did their thing, say if they had 10 tracks that they did on their vocals, I would mix it, bounce it down to where I had two so that I could save up more tracks. But everything is still here. And then I use this little knob. I had to take that to the fly to hooks. And I would basically be trying to listen to them. Now it's easy because I can literally, you got the tempo, so you can just hit it on one one thing. But this, I had to sit there and listen and spin this knob. Yep. So that's what, that's what I started on right here. What was the inspiration when I was working with Meek Mill? We was trying to accomplish just a dope album. That was his first album. And we actually recorded the whole album in Miami. He was just now blowing up. He was on the scene, fresh a haircut off from the braids. So, you know, we were trying to make sure that we put together a dope album, something that the world would feel. But also at the same time, you know, we with Maybach and it's Ross. And so, you know, we just want to make sure that everything is just super epic. But what was Meek Mill's vibe? He was a super cool dude. Like I said, he's just now coming straight off the streets of Philly. He comes from a, a battle background on the streets. Listen, everybody out here know that you ain't fucking with me. I got butter the same color as your teeth. <laughs> dog, you can't stand it with me. Man, I got some cannons White with me to do damage with me. Meek Mill, I'm the nigga they've been waiting to hear. I'm the hottest nigga around, I'm just making it clear. He was trying to kind of, you know, just kind of bring that feeling to the booth. And like I said, definitely make sure that, you know, he's the best. Pretty much, if you listen to that first album, you'll kind of go through it and you'll be like, oh yeah, he was in a nice little pocket. Rats all on my wrist, rats all on my neck, I spent rats all on my bitch, see them rats all on my chest, I said on rats. When I was young, I was like six or seven years old. I just remember I used to always like record my favorite songs on a cassette tape from the radio. That's pretty much how I got like all my music back then. So now I'm an only child. So I would always listen to those records. I was paying attention to more stuff than other people was listening. Like I'm paying attention to the stuff in the background, like background vocals. I'm paying attention to the drum pattern. I mean, then once I finally was able to actually start buying cassettes and CDs and different stuff like that, I always found myself just in the liner notes, wanting to see where they recorded it, who recorded it, who's playing the bass guitar. Of course, I don't know what that is at that time because I'm a kid. It, but I think that was probably like, okay, you're gonna probably be an engineer because you're kind of paying attention to the stuff that most people just don't pay attention to. I had a group of friends, we was in high school and all of them was rappers. Eventually I was just like, man, let me do whatever I can kind of do for them. So we started going to an actual studio and we actually went and bought a karaoke machine and we had like a voice thing and we bought a mic. And so we would just rap over that. And for me, that was the basic engineering. And then when I finally moved to Atlanta in 2001, the house that we were staying at had a studio and you know, just kind of trying to hone my skills. And then eventually we ended up getting a lot better with everything. We got some more equipment and I, the first computer program that I ever worked on was New Window. How Meek Mill got the beat, Beat Bully was actually in Miami with us. And at first he kind of started off with just those keys that you kind of hear in the intro. <laughs> and then eventually it finally turned up. Instantly like, yo, let me go ahead and get in this booth. Let's go ahead and let's do it. This is crazy even just looking at this session. <laughs> a lot of these plugins I wouldn't even use and template is, a, it's very, very, very basic. Of course you see how uh, detailed I am. If I can, I always try to get the vocals on one track. He tracked me going through a LA-2A with the Neve and then he used a U87 mic. So that was the mic that we used on it. A little birdie told me that uh, the one of the people that invented the chops and vocals and beats. Yes. You, don't, you, you don't have to claim it, but you can talk about it. So I'm gonna claim it in the way that I did it because of course, you know, Houston got they, they got their whole thing where they chopped and screwed. Yep. But the way that I did it was different because that's more of like them slowing down the whole record and kind of chopping it. I kind of started it with Wayne. So I used to call them the Young Money Chops because then Young Money kind of took it and ran with it. It was Wayne's thing. Nicky did it, early Drake, if you listen to all those records from that around that time, from 07 to like 2010, it's all got the chops. And then of course I started kind of putting it on other artists because everybody kind of took it and ran with it. Yeah, Young Money Chops is notorious. 
Yes, sir. I think I tried to cop him a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody did, man. Like I said, yeah, it's a community, though. So, you know, when I do stuff, I, I, I don't look at it like, oh, you took my swag. Like It's we, community. Yeah, it's a community. So yeah, it's yeah, like if community. I come up with something, because I listen to stuff, too, and I take it, too. I'm right. like, oh, look, listen to how that bass is sitting. Let me, <laughs> let me figure that out. Or I'm going to call whoever. Hey, Ali, how'd you get that bass sitting like that? But, you know, so, so yeah, no, it's man, it's a community. So explain it. This is just the only session, there's not a bunch of ad-libs where I usually see a, a lot of sessions that have ad-libs. This is just one lead track. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, so like I said, Meek got such a strong voice that a lot of times he always just did one track anyway. If he would have stacked it, maybe some words here and there. Yeah. And like he kind of did on the second part when it kind of gets more aggressive. Yeah. But the beginning, it's just him, you know. And maybe I throw a few delays in, stuff like that. But now nah, he doesn't really need a lot of extra stuff. And that was around the time where people would... You would do a lead, and maybe some people would do two leads, and yeah. then they'll do an ad lib track, and then maybe they stack the ad lib track. So, you know, Meek was kind of around that time where it's just his voice is strong enough. So, like I said, he's around that time where he's kind of getting into his own bag, and you kind of feel it more. That's kind of like the Jay Z thing. I always just say it's more personal Facts. when you got that one voice versus it being like eight voices coming at you because you got them panned and making it big. Facts. So, so, I like it like this, and like I said, it kind of fits this song too. And that's why, like I said, the beginning part with it being just those pianos, it's real soft and it's just him, no ad-libs, no yeah, yeah, none of that. All Actually, right. on the whole song, it's only a few ad-libs and uh, shouts out to DJ Sam Sneak. He, he did a few <laughs> ad-libs too. What? <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> shouts out to DJ Sam Because he was Sam going Sneak. crazy. Yeah, he was going crazy. So he got him one good ad-lib in there too. So I got the two track in here right now. That's what we recorded over. Shouts out to Beat Bully once again, he did the beat. Really what we started with, that intro only, the piano part, that part was only going for maybe about a good eight bars. And then eventually he finally kind of got into the thing where we was just listening to it. He was like, loop it, loop it, <laughs> loop it. Then Meek was rapping, so it was like, Okay, let's Just keep it going. It. Yeah. And then eventually he finally got to the part where he was like, hold on, wait a minute. Y'all thought I was finished? And then that's when the whole beat came in. So that, that's kind of how we kind of got the thing to build it up. And then even if you listen, it's like, kind of I did like the Young Money kind of chop thing. This is a little thing I used to always kind of do with the beat too, where it's basically, say if you got a kick, the ding, 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 ding. I would just do them like back to back to back like that. So that was kind of cool thing chopping. that I kind of did let's, in there. Let's go through that, the beat chop. Yeah, the beat chop right here. Let me show them. Yeah, that's my team, Rose, the captain. I'm lieutenant. I'm the type of can and men can. So you see something like that. Ooh, that got me turned up already. Double M, yeah, that's my team, Rose, the captain. I'm lieutenant. I'm the type of can and men cast and grind like I'm broke. And then, you know, we come back with it again, like, later on. Because one me dead, and I got to make it back home. Because my mama need that. It's like little stuff like that, though, you know, they, that's, that's what artists are looking for. They're looking for you to do stuff to the beat, yep. se sequencing and stuff like that. Maybe the producer might not even be in the room, which Beat Bully was, but, you know, they give me the, the opportunity to kind of do what I need to do. And that, that kind of goes back to what you were saying about trust, too. Right. You know, they trust me to actually, like, do stuff, not just record them. Like I said, like, I'm actually being creative in the room as well, so even though I might not necessarily be giving them lyrics. But sometimes I do that, too, if they saying something. And I'm like, yo, now nah, you should say it like this. Well, Whose idea was it to be like, real one, what up? Real one, to take the beat out. Oh, that was just me. Like I said, that's one of those things where you just kind of hear it and you're just like, the beat needs to be out. That was a solid yeah. line right there. That was a solid yeah. line right there. Everybody's kind of a part of the beginning part as far as just how long that those pianos ran. Everybody was kind of a part of that because the way that Meek was rapping. So everybody kind of put in their little sprinkles and. When he got, like I said, when he got to the uh, real nigga, what up? And hold on, wait a minute, y'all thought I was finished. He actually was saying some different stuff right there. He still had the hold on, wait a minute, y'all thought I was finished. But then he didn't say the Ashton Martin part. He said something else after that. Right. And like I said, he just ended up saying it so many times. It, it's just, it's just crazy. Was the beat chop something that you did towards the end, or were you doing it during the recording? Of course, I'm in the vibe of the session, so that's what I like to do when I'm working, and especially when I was recording. I don't really record as much now. I kind of always like to kind of, you know, just bring that feel to it. That yeah. way they can hear it and say no, or yeah, hell yeah, keep doing that. Yeah, that's the trust part of it, because I, I can imagine doing this on the fly while recording. Right. Uh, and people saying, no, 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 that's messing me up, that's messing me up. And opposed to, you know what I mean? Oh, right. no, that's hard. That's getting them yeah. turned up a little bit more. Because I almost feel like those chops couldn't have been done after he recorded it because it sounded like he got hyper with each chop. Right. Or he got, you know, when the beat went out, it just felt like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and like I said, see, he get to hear that stuff. But like I said, it hypes him up to even want to just do more. Yeah. And that's the thing is, like I said, as a good engineer, sound architect that, you know, I like to kind of bring to the session when I was recording a lot of times. Yeah. 
So we're gonna go through the vocals. I'm gonna actually solo the beat out real quick, just let you kind of hear hear a little bit of the Ain't vocals. Ain't this what they've been waiting for? Legendary. You ready? <laughs> Soon as everybody heard that at the club, you uh, already know what it is. Uh, <laughs> I used to pray for times like this, to rhyme like this, you know, so I had to grind like that. So your basic like record this. plugins were just a, a nice delay, a reverb. Nice delay, maybe reverb. Maybe a compressor on top of the 2LA? On top of the 2LA, yeah. Okay. So he's, he's going into the 2LA, and then you got the knee VQ. Okay. And then once I kind of got that over here, I've kind of run my own compressor again. Another EQ. I always use a D-verb. I know a lot of people can be like, oh, why is he using D-verb? But it's like, it's basic, yeah, it it's simple. Classic. And I know how to work it. Like, everything that I need to work about it, I, I love it. So I still use it to this day. Like I said, I love the R compressor. Renaissance 6. Now, a lot of times now, I actually use a Pro EQ. You know, back then, uh, R EQ 6, we're going to run it up with that guy. And then the R Vokes, that just kind of bumps it up a little bit, give it a little bit of griminess to it. Yep. Just kind of, you know, like I said, just elevate the voice a lot more. So normally, I always start with the compressor. I used to pray for times like this, to rhyme like this, so I If you pay attention, like, like that, right like now, he's kind of calm, so you're not really, it's not really hitting as much. Yeah. Because you see, you got the, uh, the ratio right there. So you, if I wanted to hit a little bit more, we're here. Like, you see, that kind of muddies them up. Yeah. All I'm trying to do, I'm just trying to kind of, you know, compress them. I'm just trying to kind of balance them out a little bit, which definitely helped more so around the end parts. Because even if you look at the waves of these, you can see that he's distorted. Yeah. Because like I said, he was kind of yelling into the mic. He didn't really want to back up. And it's only so low that I could actually put the mic to get his vocals. I mean, you can kind of see the parts right there where it's distorted. Like, all this stuff right here, it's all distorted. But you would never really be able to tell by the way I ended up EQing it. So was that your intention to immediately, I know when mixers do things, the immediate things is, what don't I like about this recording that I can make better? Right. Is that something that, was bothering you at the time or was that something that was like the distortion is kind of cool it, it was bothering me because of course no engineer wants stuff to be distorted because if you wanted something to be distorted i'd rather distort it myself right. rather than it being distorted right especially when it's the vocals right but at the end of the day it was cool because the name of the song was dreams and nightmares and the part that is distorted on there and it wasn't it's like a just a crazy distorted it's the, that's the nightmare wow so it fits Wow. It all made sense. So that's why I didn't run really like, wow. ah, nah, go back and do that takeover. That's it, fire. It just fits. That, that makes it even better mm -hmm. than you hear it like that because he's he's angry and distorted in the nightmare part, but in, right. the, in the dream part, it's the dream. That's, right, and that's, it's, that's smooth. It feels that's good. That's fire. And then it gets, fire. it gets crazy. That's you know fire. That's and fire. what you'll see even how I made the song even a lot more meaner once I actually mixed the beat. Yeah. You'll see how I made it a lot more meaner when the kicks and the 808s come in and stuff like that. Because me as an engineer, one of the things that I like to do as well, I mean, of course, we want everything to be sonically, technically right, mm. but no, we break rules. That's right. I, I mean, as long as, like I said, even with the red, if we in the red and it's distorted, mm -hmm. if it sounds good and feels good, I'm going to roll with it like that. Mm -hmm. That's the way that I like to do it. I always just say ghetto mix. That's kind of how I describe what I do. <laughs> so normally with this one, I probably would start on the, the nightmares part just because with me working with the compressor, just because I know that's kind of the part where I need to kind of balance that stuff out. I know a few people try to use vocal writer. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times I always like to kind of start with a preset, especially if I'm trying to learn the plugin. I start with a preset and then kind of work it from, from there. So on this one, I always normally go with a vocal. And of course, everything's at thresholds of zero. So if I'm playing it, I'm, it's not hitting anything. It's not, no compression, no nothing. But then I'll take my threshold. And normally what I'm looking for, depending on what I'm what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to normally get in between that negative three, negative six, and even sometime under that if I am, because like I said, you don't want to over compress it. Yeah. Because at the same time, if you do that, then you kind of get into that little thing where you muffle their voice up. Yeah. You don't want them to sound muffled. You still want them to be clear. So I would do that. And of course, you're taking a little bit of something out, so I'm going to give it a little more gain. The attack, I normally, uh, I like a normally a pretty good fast attack. And a fast release. Sometimes I hit them, hit, hit it warm, smooth. On this one, I'm just gonna keep it on warm. Yeah. So that sounds sounds a little cool. I can maybe back off the threshold just a little bit. 
You fuck around, you fuck around, you so fuck around. So if you, you, like I said, you can sit there and hear where it's distorted in certain parts, but it sounds good once everything is married together. And so what I'm looking for in the vocal, I want to tame those highs, but at the same time, I still want them to be crispy. But I don't want it to be prison, especially if you got it in your headphones. Yep. And he's just yelling and it's just like, oh, I can't, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just to kill my eardrums over here. Like, it's crazy. And like right. I said, he's already got a high-pitched voice in the way that he's rapping, he's hype. Yeah. And of course, you know, even me, I got a deep voice. If I scream, though, my voice is high-pitched. Facts. And he's kind of screaming in this part, so his voice is super high-pitched. So you rolling off the the bottom? Do the why lows. why is that? I, I see a lot of people do that with vocals. Why they why would you do that with his particular vocal? So of course that takes off some of that muddiness that you gotcha. kind of have. Okay. Like say if you do sound just a little, it's like you should take some of that off. And I'm not trying to take out your whole voice because I still want you to sound like you. I want you to sound like I'm talking to you in this room. Facts. Kind of start with that. And I, I just kind of look and kind of see. I move it over here. Sometimes I get real extreme with it just to see. And of course you see how that, now he took all his bass out, now he sounds crazy. Right. But you know, I feel like maybe that's about a good, about that 125K range, negative six. Then I'll even take a little bit of the mid, bring a little, a little bit of that down, change the cue a little bit on that one. And then I'll maybe try to go and add a little few highs just to see. That's a little too much. Then I check the mids just to see. And normally I just try to kind of scrub. Are you, if you want to add, but you see that sounds crazy with the mids. Right. But then you see if I take a little bit of that out, it sounds cool. But then to me, it still sounds a little bit too high. So I kind of bring that down. Might even bring that down a Nah. Kind of like that. And too, even with this plugin, it's it's like I said, it's updated now, so you can actually see the waves bouncing. Mm -hmm. Back then, the wave didn't bounce on the plugin. Nah, absolutely not. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's still kind of a cheat code because at least I can kind of look at it and kind of tell. Yeah, but the back then, I'm, yeah. I'm going off my ears. Yeah. <laughs> I should have looked at it before I took it off, too, just to see. But that kind of let me know where, I, like I said, I'm trying to take some mids out. So it's like, okay, cool. I can kind of see where it's where it's spiking. And it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good. So that sounds good right here. And so I get on up out of here. You know, I, I get on out of here. And then normally, that's, that's important, too, making a decision. When you're mixing this and you're a perfectionist, when do you know to back out? You know what I mean? It's like, man. This is the decision I'm I'm committing to with EQ. I'm not gonna sit here for 30 minutes and do that. I mean, you want to be efficient with what you're doing. So mm, yeah. so you don't want to like get to a point where you're just sitting there EQing one vocal for 30 minutes. Like right. that's ridiculous. Get it sounding good. Right. So of course, once I get the beat in it, I'm gonna probably have to go back and redo it anyway. Yeah, but now you got a basic look. I got a basic look, and that's okay. all I'm pretty much looking for. And normally, that's what I try to do. So. Of course, you see, I haven't loaded the beat in yet. Right. But normally, I'll go ahead and load the beat in. But I, I do like to mix the vocals first. Gotcha. Just to kind of get a good bass for it. Then I'll go mix the beat. And normally, I do the drums first. Yeah. And then once I get the drums, I kind of play the drums and the vocals together. Gotcha. Before I add okay. the actual music into it. What the consideration of this is that because, like some people say, hey, it takes me four hours to mix a record. It takes me two hours to mix a record. Is it time set up for each thing? Or is it just like... I'm just not going to uh, dominate this EQ for about 30 minutes because you know you're on a time limit. Well, I'm never on a time limit because, of course, like when I'm here at Tree Sounds, I'm booked out. I got the studio for basically a week because I, I mixed four songs for him total off that album. Gotcha. Uh, Fabian mixed the rest. Okay. So, he, uh, like I said, I mixed the four. So, I knew I had four days, five days to come in here for 12-hour blocks and do what I need to do. Which I knew I didn't need full 12 hour blocks for four or five days to do those songs. Yeah. And this one, I can kind of look at it. So like even just with the beat, once I load the beat and you'll see it's not really that many sounds. Because of course at the beginning, that's a piano loop. Right. So that's all that is. So pretty much just once I kind of get that sounding good, that's done. This is old school. So I actually have my D-verb actually on the aux track, that's which hard. I would never do. That's hard. <laughs> I would never do that yeah. now, though. Yeah. You, got <laughs> Maybe your sin, you got your sins going? Yeah. You know, this is 2012, so you know, the, <laughs> the reverb is on my on the damn uh, aux for the for the vocals. This, so this is where we at with it. Got that good old haul on here. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you want to go easy with it, because normally, of course, when you have it on, for one, your gain is going to be at 
negative four. Normally when you cut this on, the decay is normally gonna be at four seconds and this dry wet is always gonna be all the way up at 100. So of course you need to cut that down because it'll sound like crazy like this. You don't want it sounding like that. Oh, and then I cut that gain, I put that on zero. And I do that because if you put it on the negative four, it basically kind of sucks the vocals in. But then, like I said, I kind of mess with the wet. And on this one, I ain't go over too much. Cause also, it really depends on the song, but I'm not a person that really like super reverbs a lot of stuff up. Now, if the song calls for it, then yeah, I'll definitely mm -hmm. do it. I think I kind of got the verb in a good little place where I kind of want it. But after that, I normally put this R Vox on here and I'm gonna play it first without it. So of course you kind of hear it and it's, it's already in a good place. But what this R-Vox does, you hear it just kind of jump up. So that's, that's without it. And this kind of gives it an extra little. So R-Vox is considered a compressor or what is it? A limiter? Like what is it considered? It's kind of both. Okay. So it is a compressor and it is a limiter at the same time. But also at the same time, like I said, it's bumping it up. But it's not super compressing it like how yeah. a normal compressor would gotcha. do. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm pretty much I don't even really mess with too many other controls. I'm literally only using this comp right here, and which on this one, I know this is old because I will probably never get to negative seven on the vocal. <laughs> 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 so, because normally I'm kind of just pressing it. It might be like a negative two, negative three or something like that. Yep. But negative seven is a lot. But hey, like I said, it's 2012, so this is where we at. We, <laughs> we, we backtracking, man. You know, yeah, like, we backtrack. It's kind of one of those things, too, I always like to say, like, when a song goes out, it's kind of never done. So that's how you were saying, like, earlier about, like, how do you let go? Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, it feels good in this moment. But at the end of the day, it's plenty of songs that I hear. I'm still like, man, if I could just touch that one more time. Like, that's how everybody's going to be, <laughs> bro. Every beat that I produced on a song is always that one thing I wish I'd have did better. <laughs> exactly. Or, Wish I got a chance to, you know, I was going through some of the stuff when I do different chops and something just accidentally created some magic. I was like, Damn, why didn't that magic have an end? <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Like, wow. So I got the vocals kind of where I want them at. And then, of course, I went with a cool little, nice little delay. Let me see what tempo it is, because all I did was name it Delay 1, which I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> delay 1, it looks like that's a good old, that's a half note. Yeah. So, you know, we go like with it. One of them things, like I said, this is giving it more space. Certain parts of the song, you'll hear it like when the beat was dropped out and he's like, real nigga, what up? Real nigga, what up? You'll kind of hear it in the background there. But a lot of times when he's rapping, especially when he's rapping fast, mm -hmm. he's not really giving it time to even actually hit. So it's like you hear it, but you don't hear it. And right. maybe in certain parts, like I said, when I drop the beat out, different stuff like that, that's kind of when you hear that delay. Got it. But it's more of just a background thing, because I could have went. So like I said, it's kind of light, but I could have went where it's like. But that sounds crazy. That wouldn't have been good in the club. <laughs> that that doesn't work. <laughs> that's just out of control. Yeah, the club wouldn't like that. And a lot of times, even if you see like these different clips or whatever. Yeah. A lot of these I've kind of moved either up or down or if you want to, I mean, I don't really like doing it this way most time, but you can go to the volume. But I see here you have multiple manual rides, which is kind of cool. Just when I'm listening to it, like, oh, that part's too loud. Let me bring it down. Yeah. And not, not oh, let me go back to the compressor and recompress it a little more. <laughs> like, no, just, just bring the volume down. And like I said, that, that, that's pretty much all you need at the end of the day. The ad libs, are, are you using the same type of chain with the lead? a copy of of the same thing right so of course you see i still got the same stuff yeah but then what i end up doing is i go on the ad lib and i go to this guy ssl right here and all the engineers pretty much know if you want that uh radio effect what they're gonna use on the ssl <laughs> we're gonna go to that cla both <laughs> filter votes <laughs> and that's Yo. gonna be with and like i said i mean it's a good preset yeah you go from the preset and then i just tweak it a little bit from there but uh -uh. And shouts out to my boy Chris Lord Algae for the, you know. He killed it. He killed it. <laughs> he killed it. So this is amazing. And then you've heard this radio effect on millions of rap songs on ad libs. Yep. Uh, I promise you. So. And you see, I use the faster delay on yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a little bit more delay as well. Double I mean, uh, on the verb. A little yeah, bit more on there. Fast delay, and this is it without. Like my ghost, 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 
without the filter. And the delay sounds crazy on there, but it's like once you add it with the vocal, once you add it with the vocal, it's crazy. Oh, it sounds like, sound good. And, it, and even with the beat, see, it just brings like that, it's, it's cinematic. It brings that feel to it. Hard. But what I'm not seeing that most people use is a de Yeah. Why are you not using that? And it's crazy because this is Meek Mill. <laughs> right. That I'm not using a de -esser. If anybody you could think of that probably wants a de -esser, it's Meek Mill. Okay. But on this one, I just didn't feel like I needed to do it because I felt like I got the, the uh, arc comp right. Gotcha. The compression right. So if I feel like I got the compression right, then I try not to really... I feel like de is kind of just another compressor anyway. That's yep. all you're really doing. Facts. And... I don't feel like he said a lot of S's in there anyway. Right. So it wasn't like a thing where, like I said, once again, it's not piercing me. Right. Now, if it was, and I like where I got it, I, I, like I said, I won't go back and try to overcompress again, yep. and I will use the de -esser. So I think we got good on the ad-libs, and then, like I said, we got my boy Sam Sneak in there. What? Hard. I never knew that. <laughs> Shout out to Sam. Yo, Sneak. <laughs> Sam Sneak, man. What? Shout out. We give, I don't know, man. We're going to play without the B2 again. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's hard. And then, of course, you can kind of see, too, where um, even on the ad-libs, where you see I got, I'm got i kind of doing automations on the delay. So delay is on the whole thing. Whoa, right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then, okay, I don't want it right here. Double M, team rotator. No, Be back. No, 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 no. You know. Like I'm pro. Architecture. And that's bringing, you know, life to, to the record at the end of the day. Yeah. Because, I mean, I could take all this stuff off and it probably wouldn't even feel the same to you. Or I could have did a lot more delays on certain words. You could have been like, oh, that's too much. Right. So like I said, this is it's definitely a taste thing at the end of the day. Gotcha. Let's load this beat in, man. How important is the organization of your session right here? The, even with me, I always like to have my beat at the top. Me too. There's certain ways that I like yep. to do stuff. Yep. And I'm gonna do that first. And then like I said, when I just uploaded this, so of course all these sounds, they in different ways. So I see like the bell is at the top. Mm -hmm. I don't want the bell at the top. I always put my drums at the top. I do the same thing. Basically, in whatever order I'm gonna mix it, that's the order I put the beat in. Dope. So then we got the triangle, and like I said, I always like to put all my stuff. So you got the kick at the top. Yep. Snare under the kick, and I'm kind of looking too, um, just like seeing where the waves is at. Clap and snare is about the same, so that's cool. You got the bell, choir is probably the main sound. You're seeing some real serious OCD right here, cause I'm the same way. Yeah, we gotta put it. <laughs> I gotta put this waves, thing together. Matching colors. I had labeled these because I, I took them out, but I had to label them so I could kind of re-upload them. Yep. But of course, a lot of times when the producer is putting them in, it might be labeled, I don't know, PZX, negative three, four, five, just weird names. So when I listen to it, I'll just say, okay, this track right here, I'll solo it out. That's probably a sound that a lot of people probably didn't even pay attention in the beat. I didn't hear it. Now, I don't know what this sound, the sound was actually named from Beat Bully, but it just sounded mean to me. So, so I named, named it mean? mean. <laughs> <laughs> this is mean. It's mean, like that. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I roll with. Like, I think that's the pizzicato because I just made the piss. Yeah. So you got that. Man, this man is a real orchestra. Nah, he's oh, he a one, one man orchestra. <laughs> Beat Bully went crazy. <laughs> Got that strings, um, then you got the triangle, which you go up here. So now I actually do folders instead of oxtracks a lot. Since we backtracking and I'm trying to make it sound the way that it did, we're just gonna go with the good old ox track and I'm gonna name it Beat Master. Pick any bus on here. I'm gonna rename it, make sure that all of them is going through the Beat Master. Yep, so now we don't need the two track anymore, but I like to keep it there. The Maybach music still play, but you see, I'm gonna have to still go back right. in and Actually mute and out the piano. That piece so, out. Yep. so what I normally do, I just kind of go ahead and just do that before I do anything. Chop that out. Wow. That's gone. This is basically how I already kind of did the chops. So of course you heard the chops. Oh, right. <laughs> you heard a little click in there, but it's that's just from the two track. Yeah, that's the natural part. Okay. So I did this. And that was pretty much the whole beat. So when I'm doing these chops, I just basically take the whole beat, copy, and then I see I did the first one right there. So 
<laughs> that's fine that's pretty much what it is and i just yeah. like i said i find that little spot that i'm a loop and then i put it back in where i want it and you hear those little clicks in it so what i would normally do i would take that put a cool little crossfade on there yep. and i'm going to go ahead and do it on all of them so that you can actually hear that the click kind of goes away no clips. Nice and clean. No clips. No clip. So we're good now. That's all it takes. And of course, you can see right there where the beat basically had ended. Oh, that's what the fade was. I was looking at them like, what's the fade about? Oh, that's the genius. That's the. Wow. And then that's the part. Wow. And it's like, hey, bring it back. Magic. That's basically what Magic. it was. Magic. Bring it the back. The beat ended. He <laughs> outwrapped the beat. He outwrapped the beat. So the beat was only <laughs> two minutes and 39 seconds. And once it ended, I basically just re-looped that whole part again. Mm. And that's kind of the whole sequence. Because it actually still does those chops and all that in the same exact spot. Yeah. But I noticed when the chops and the drums come out, oh, well, it does that again. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's dope. This is one of the few songs I've ever played in a club as a DJ where I played it to the very end. <laughs> to the whoop at the end. Yep. I never really get to the end of any song. Like, that's so crazy, like, that we play that in a song. And you have to talk after that. Like, yo, because everybody's just so damn hype from the song. Right. You take a break. You, I've never heard nobody cut breathe. off Meek Mill's song here. That's the big song of the night. If the DJ played this song before your set, you would have to slap him. Facts. Listen. <laughs> This was the most dominating song for New Year's for at least five, six years. Right. That's 12 o'clock, Happy New Year. Doo -doo. Yep. That's yep. across the board, anywhere. Vegas, LA, Atlanta. Miami. Miami, New York. Argentina. Di bro, <laughs> everywhere. That's just what it is. The Philadelphia games, you, if we're getting the crowd riled up, you have to play this song. Right. You have to. He won the Super Bowl that year. Mm -hmm. Remember, he was locked up. Yep. But the dude, they was going crazy in the locker Man, room. On that song. What? Please, nigga, please, for them trick squeeze them, get cream. Never let them hoes get in between. You fuck around, you fuck around, you fuck around, you fuck around. Nothing funny, niggas, I won't worry. You fuck around, you fuck around. So when we get to the master, when you're done with the actual mix, mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you use on a master? Because all you're really trying to get it is you're just trying to get a little bit more volume on it. Because, right. I mean, of course, if you recorded the song right, it's right. not going to be as loud as, right. of course, when they get in the car, they want to hear it loud. So right. that's really, I'm just trying to kind of boost it up. So it's two kind of different ways that I do it. Because when I'm recording and I just print it out for you, I might use the G comp and a L2 mm -hmm. just to kind of just give it that little extra um from be able to round it out and make it sound big. Right. But when I'm doing a mix, so when I take those plugins off, I don't want it to sound different. Mm -hmm. So when I'm sending you the mix, I really, the only thing I really do is just do a cool little L2, L3 or something. Gotcha. Now L3. Because, like I said, I'm really just trying to get a volume. Okay. More so than me trying to, like, shape it. Because I have to take that stuff off to send it to Master. Do you turn it down some DBs? You keep it the same? So you see, it's already kind of loud. There's like, no L2 on it. Without the L2, <laughs> yeah. And see, that L2, what it'll do, it basically, once I do cut it on, I can get it to that zero without it really just staying in there and trying to kind of distort it. So. It's almost like the compressor of the song to a certain gotcha. extent, yep. especially for this one. So that'll be one of those ones where, like I said, I'm not pushing the L2 and going negative seven. Like, nah, cool little negative one, throw the ceiling on about 0 0.1, and yep. hey, I'm good. Because I'm just trying to kind of balance it out. So I'll kind of sit there and look. And normally what I'll do when I'm sending it for master, so this one is kind of loud. So what I'll do, I'll go to the loudest part of the song. And then I just kind of cut it down until I kind of get it to that negative six. Where do you tell the loudest part of the song? I can basically in, look at it. In so. the meter. So if you got, so if you're looking there on, on the master meter telling me what's the loudest part, or are you looking at the waves? 
I'm looking at the waves basically, and more so the beat. Okay. So of course I already know the the nightmares part of this song is automatically the loudest part of this song. Fuck around, get killed. You fuck around, you fuck around. Oh, shit. So I know that part. So it's two loud parts that's in there. But I can tell already this is more the chill part of that part. Right. So then So that part right there, that's the loudest part of the song. Right. And I can basically tell by all the sounds playing in the beat. Right. And then what I'll do is I'll come down here. That'll be kind of where I look at it. Still kind of loud, still kind of loud. So that's about good for me to send it up and ask right there. So you have an L2 on there. If you put that I, L I cut that off. Okay. So this is once I'm sending it for mastering. Okay. So, so like I said, that's the only time I actually cut that down. But when I'm just sending you the mix, I just kind of go ahead and throw that L2 just to kind of balance the, the levels out as far as the volume goes or whatever. And of course, you can kind of look but if I went back to zero. And too, when I'm looking at it, I'm trying to make sure that even though I got that L2 on, I'm still trying to make sure I got movement right here. Yep. Because it's just a smash. Yeah, I don't want to be smashed. So I'm looking for movement. But also, I'm not looking for it to be the loudest either because I want it to be louder. But I, you know, if they hit me and like, oh, it's a, the volume's kind of low. I'm like, don't worry about that. <laughs> it's going to be fixed and mastered. always the thing. Yeah, it's just, I'm just gave you something that's a little bit louder, but I'm, it's not going to be the final volume. Talk about the relationship between the mixer and the master and what kind of dialogue and language y'all have to use between each other to get to the optimal space of this is the actual final master. For me, that's Glenn Schick. Um, I've worked with him probably 85, 95% of all the mixes I've probably ever done in my life. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, he kind of knows what I'm looking for. Even if he doesn't know what I'm looking for, I can kind of explain it to him and he gets it without me having to really go super crazy. And like I said, that's just the whole thing. And I actually started rocking with him off top because, you know, one of the very first mixes that I ever did in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this is when I find out mixing is where it's at. I see Leslie's key ring and he's got Lambos <laughs> and Rolls Royces. I'm like, oh, he, he's mixing those. Drop top Ferrari. Yeah, drop I remember. top Ferrari. Yeah, like, I shouts out to Leslie, yeah. man, the GOAT. I do the song. That, this is my first time ever track with the full track out beat, full session, all that stuff. I end up giving it to Glenn to get it mastered. They accepted the mix, though. So they rocking with it. I'm thinking I'm good. They send it off to him. Hits me and says, I'm not mastering the song. <laughs> I'm not mastering that. <laughs> I'm not mastering that. Fan. I'm not mastering it, man. And, and but like I said, what I rock with him is he said that, but he also gave me an idea of what I could do to actually fix it. So yeah, I do that, and we just end up building a good cohesive uh, relationship, and we've been rocking since then. And that's why it's super important because I mean that's the final sound. I think I pretty much got it in a good little spot, one good listen, just to make sure that I kind of level some stuff out or if I need to kind of change anything. Take the part that got the most sounds, I like to kind of go ahead and just start with that. If I'm trying to get that grimy feel, I just go for a good lo-fi. So I point forward distortion, saturation two. That sounds good. I'm not really big on um, parallel compression, stuff like that. And then we go to the snare. Throw a little EQ on there. And what I normally do, I try to kind of boost the mids a little bit. Play those together. All right. That sounds pretty good to me. And you hear that clap got a little bit of reverb, so that kind of makes it ring off a little bit. Throw that kick back in there just to see. If it sounds good, then I don't throw a plug in on it at all. If I think it already sounds good, I just kind of level it out in the beat. This one already sounds pretty good to me, so I'm just gonna level it. And you know that hi-hat gives you that, gives you that tempo, gives you that. So you wanna hear that kind of coming through. And we got the good some bells, got some good bells. Just kind of use this Renaissance ox, kind of just bring it up. Something light, and then I'm just balance it out. Got the triangle. <laughs> Pretty self-explanatory. And once again, hey, it's cool. I can hear it. It actually even sounds good. I might turn it down just a little bit. That sounds good to me. So the piano, of course, got two different parts because you got the dreams part, you got the nightmares part. Make it sound big and wide. 
I always like to kind of use the S1. Kind of spread that out a little bit. That way, once you hear it, it'll kind of sound, it'll sound super big, especially if you got headphones on or if you're in the car. Then we'll go back to put a little EQ on there. We're not gonna do too, too much to it. Yeah, that feels good right there. Yeah, that feels good, that feels good. My Renaissance Ox just to kind of bump it up a little bit more too. And of course, this is just playing by itself. Yeah, so I want to hear it all together. Piano sound a little loud. Yeah. Yeah, I like that though. So then we got our choir. We're going to rock with him. Ain't too much going on with that. And then the sound got some movement. So once again, I just kind of use the Renaissance Ox. I might even EQ EQ at this time. We'll turn that down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of more of like a bass tone too, so that's kind of why. So that's meshing with that 808, so I'm gonna probably have to EQ this just a little bit. And what I'll do, I'll take a little bit of that out. Take a little bit of low out just to but not a, not a lot though, because I still want it to be mean. It ain't gonna sound mean if it ain't got no bass in it. Yeah, that sounds good. Level even sound good. Right. You see, that brings a lot of energy to it too, that Pizzicato. Once again, it's got movement, so right now I'm just not gonna touch it. I'm just gonna level it out. It sound crazy hearing all these sounds separate by themselves after all this time, too. I want this to kind of, I want it to sound big and nice and, nice and noisy. It just makes it sound a little bigger. Sounds good. Then we got strings. I'm just gonna level it out. Then we got one more little little thing to add on in the beat, and then we are done with it. Maybach music. Maybach music. That sounds more like it. So yeah, now I got everything together. Time I spent on some locked up shit in the back of the paddy wagon, cuffs locked on wrist. See my dreams unfold, nightmares come true. It was time to marry the game, and I said, yeah, I do. If you want it, you gotta see it with a clear eye view. Got shorty, she try and bless me like I said I'd chew, like a nigga sneeze. I think I got it pretty close, man, for real. Appreciate y'all checking me out. It was fun actually doing this. Appreciate you, Cannon, for inviting me. Backtrack.